We're going to be talking tonight about regeneration. Does anyone know what that is? It's a big word. Growing? Growing? Okay, yeah. Um, in another sense, the, the best way to think about it is being born again. You guys, have, you, have you ever heard the term being born again before? Have you guys heard that statement? Isn't that like a really awkward statement to hear, being born again? Well, anyway, if you have your Bibles, we're going to get into it, and I'll talk a little bit about that. If you have your Bible, open up to John chapter 1. I'm going to be reading three verses, 10 through 13. Let me know when you're there. Say there. there. Wow, dude. I'll give you guys time. I don't like those preachers that tell you to turn your Bible there, and they start reading. You're like eight verses behind, and you're still trying to look for it, and you just pretend you're like an Ezekiel, and you know, you're just kind of like waiting there, but you're not in the right place. I'm sorry. All right, John chapter 1. 10 through 13. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Amen. So how many of you guys have heard this term, born again? Okay. You guys are all in high school or college or whatever it is. If you've taken some sort of bio class, you understand how nasty and creepy this term would be if you actually had to do it, right? So let's, let's think about that for a second. Not too deep because it's really weird. You would literally have to go back into your mom and get birthed again. Do, do you understand that? Do you understand how weird that is? I know, it's really weird. So there's a story, there's a guy named Nicodemus, and he's in the book of John, and he actually comes to Jesus in the middle of the night. And this is what he says, I'm going to read from John 3, 1 through 8. It says, there's a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish uh, religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus, and he said, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied to him, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and of spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So check this out. This guy comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, and he's asking him, okay, how do I get into heaven? How do I become right with you? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And this man, who's a very knowledgeable man, says that, how can this possibly be? How can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus isn't talking about a physical born again. He's not telling you to physically go back into your mother's womb. What he's actually saying is that the person inside of you, the spirit man inside of you, the one that actually knows right and wrong, the one that controls the way you think, the one that sees creation and the people around you, that man inside of you needs to be born again. That spirit inside of you that controls the way you think, that alters your decisions, that makes you go here and there, that one that kind of gives you those thoughts throughout the day, throughout the night, that person inside of you needs to be renewed and seen through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And many times we see through the lens of sin, don't we? Let's be honest, like, Many times we don't care about God, we don't care about good things, we don't care that we sin, we don't care that we hurt others, we don't care that we steal from other people, we don't care when we offend someone else. Many times that being inside of us just doesn't seem to care to those things, right? And what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here is that in order for us to see the kingdom of God, in order for us to make it to heaven, in order for us to be in fellowship with God forever, which is the ultimate plan. The ultimate plan isn't just to get to heaven. For if Jesus is not in heaven, I don't want to be there. Our ultimate plan is to be with Jesus. And Jesus has certain standards that if we aren't born again and see through the way he sees things, then we cannot have fellowship with him. And all people, in order for us to have fellowship with God, we all individually, personally, have to be born again, have a 180 degree turn in our life, and be radically changed by the Holy Spirit in Christ. Every single person. So your mom can't be born again for you. Your dad can't be born again for you. Colleen Vedish can't be born again for you. The Holy Spirit inside of you needs to regenerate you into a new creation, and you must become born again yourself. 
And with this, youth, there is no ands, ors, ifs, or buts. We cannot see God in his fullness. We cannot be with God in fullness. We cannot walk in holiness without being born again. Thank you. Praise the Lord. So check this out. Now, now that we kind of touch base on that, there are two things I want to talk about tonight as we talk about regeneration. If you, you like the term born again, if you like the term new creation, whatever works for you. But I'm going to talk about two certain topics tonight that show us or tell us what happens when you're born again and to check yourself to see if you actually had that rebirth of being born again. So the first one is, this first topic that I'm going to be talking about is there will be a 100 degree change in the way you live. I'll say it again. There will be a 180 degree change in the way you live. So you've been walking this way, one direction for a while. The Holy Spirit, one direction. You'll be walking this way. The Holy Spirit inside of you will convict you of the way you're living, will change your heart, will soften the things that you've been hardened against and the things that you, once you love to do, you'll now despise. The way you used to talk one way now will be changed. The way you thought of Christ from a human perspective will now be configured to make you think through the Holy Spirit's thoughts and you will go from this direction to this direction. It will be completely different and it has to be in this way so that when those who see you will know that there's a difference with you. Check this out. I wrote a little definition of what it means to be born again. If you truly believe that Jesus came down from heaven, died on the cross for your sins, that he resurrected from the dead to prove his victory of sin and death, in your life, then you are truly born again. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you do not believe that he rose from the dead to, and died on the cross to pay your sins and my sins, then there's something in you that still needs to be awoken up. John 1, 10 through 13, like, like we read earlier, says he came to the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. His own people rejected him. Check this out, but verse 12, but to all who believed him, accepted him, and he gave the right to become children of God. So it is a privilege to be called the child of God. By you believing in him and accepting him, you've been given the right to be a child of God. And it says this in verse 13. You are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So check this out. Many times we know how it is, man. Okay, we're all in high school. We're all in college when you like someone, you sleep with someone, you have sex with someone, you have intimacy with someone, you might plan a child, you might not plan a child, but through that, that's what comes out. What Jesus is saying this, not from physical birth, not from the things resulting from our human passion, rather, the birth comes from God himself. So it's as if I've been pregnated by the Holy Spirit and he gives birth out to me, this new creation that is now Christ in me. Let me ask you guys a question. So when, when a child is born, what happens over the course of the first few years of that child? He has to what? He has to learn how to walk. He has to learn how to, give me some other ones. He has to learn how to talk. He has to learn how to eat. Okay? When God gives birth into you through the Holy Spirit and you become born again, you learn to talk differently. You learn to walk differently, spiritually speaking. The way you've been walking, you're now walking in a different direction. You learn to eat differently. So the things I used to feed myself with earlier, with deception of sin and things that I thought were right one way and I thought that this lifestyle was okay, now I'm beginning to eat the things of the Holy Spirit that tell me this is the way I should live, this is the way I should think, this is the way I should act. I begin to eat of the things that he shows me. And the things that we're feeding, our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirits are now changed according to what the Holy Spirit says about us, not what I thought was right. Let me give you guys examples, like things in our own life. So maybe you might be one direction thinking of the way you're acting now or the way you were acting. You used to cuss all the time. You used to watch dirty movies. You used to listen to certain music. And then all of a sudden, something changes in you when you're born again where you put that same song on and then you're like, man, I don't even want to listen to this. You know, you start, you start, you start cussing and then obviously like you're into conversations with people. Maybe a word might slip and you're about to say like, blah. Bitcoin, you know? Man, that girl's a Bitcoin. Your words start to change because 
one, direct, one way you were earlier, now in this new sense as a birth of the Holy Spirit, you don't like to say those things anymore. You don't like to talk the way you used to talk. You don't like to gossip the way you used to gossip. You don't like to lie the way you used to lie. You don't like to steal from people the way you used to steal from people. And now because of that Holy Spirit's manifesting in your soul, in your spirit, man, he is the one who's actually birthing out of you, giving you the direction of life and how you are supposed to walk with him. There has to be a 180 degree change in our life. 1 Peter 4.3 says this, you've had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy. You've had enough. Being born again means that you get to a point in your life where you say, I've had enough of the way I'm living now and I want change. I want to change from the way I've been acting. I want to change from the way I've been speaking. And I'll, I, just, I didn't plan this, but Chris, you saw how many times when we were young, how many times do we make fun of people? How many times do we pick on people? How many times do we do stupid things? And now I look back on those things like, what was wrong with me? I look back on the way I act and I think, man, I, I, instead of being cruel and mean to people, I just want to love on people now. Something inside of me has sparked up. The spirit has impregnated, impregnated me in a way where now I want to think and act how he thinks and how he acts. I no longer want to follow the inclinations of my sinful nature. I no longer want to watch pornography. I no longer want to smoke weed. I no longer want to go out and go clubbing. I no longer want to look at that girl and picture her naked. I no longer want to go out with that dude and do things that people don't want us to know we're doing. I no longer want to do these things because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's presence inside of me is saying, I am leading you now. I am the one who's taking control of your life. I am the one who's telling you what's right and what's wrong. I am the one giving you the desire and the will to do what pleases me. Philippians 2.13. The Holy Spirit leads me. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The old life is gone and new life has begun. That means my old life, my former life is now dead and now I am a new creation. Romans 6 talks about this very clearly. It says, don't you know that you died with Christ when he was baptized? When you were baptized, you, you buried yourself with Christ. And as Christ rose from the, gra the grave, now you've clothed yourself with him. So this is why I emphasize baptism so strongly because when you, when you want to get baptized, and Danny and Molly and other people who, who, who want to do this or who have done this, what you're doing is you're declaring, I no longer live for myself. I clothe myself with Christ's death. I put on his death and his resurrection. Now when people see me, I reflect the glory of God because he's the one who changed my life. And you know what's so, it's kind of cool. I'll put it this way. It's cool, but it's also a struggle. Because once you're a new creation, people see you differently, but people see you differently. And what I mean by this is there's, this is what I mean by it. Man looks at you and says, that's the same girl I used to hook up with. That's the same guy I used to smoke and party with. That's the same person I used to do so and so with, right? But what does Jesus say? That's a new creation. That's a totally changed person. That's someone completely transformed. So your former friends know you one way. Your former family knows you one way. Now they see you completely different and they're dumbfounded. And it's what the Holy Spirit does in us. That's, that's evidence and proof that the Holy Spirit has touched your life. I'll say that again. If you are completely transformed from the way you previously were, and it stands out to a way where people say that person is completely different, you've been touched and marked by the Holy Spirit. If you are going the same way, acting the same way, speaking the same way, thinking the same way, declaring God as your God and still acting like that, you have not been born again. It, it sucks to hear sometimes. But if you're living the same way as you were before, before you proclaim Christ, now you proclaim Christ living the same way, you have not been born again. But Christ says we are a new creation. He doesn't see our sins anymore. He sees us through the veil of Christ. He sees us through the blood of his son. And we talked about like not having or not, not wanting that stuff anymore. I've had enough, right? We want to go into a new life. We want to go into a new walk. Well, some people might say, well, won't I have enough of God at a certain point? Like, won't I, won't I have a relationship with God where I get like, dude, I don't want this anymore. I'm sick of it. I've had it too much. No. And this is the reason. Because in the flesh, this is how the flesh works, all right? When you eat and when you drink, 
Your body says, I'm full and I want no more, right? So the more I eat and the more I drink, the more full I am. But in the spirit, everything is backwards. So the spirit, the more I eat and the more I drink, the more I cry out and say, God, I want more. The more, the more the spirit inside of me says, I'm thirsty, I need more of him. The more I read my Bible, the more I pray, the more I'm interacting with him, the more I'm worshiping, the more I'm praising him, the more the spirit man inside of me says, you need more. So that's what's so dope about God. That the more I want of him, the more he gives me of him. I don't get bored of him. I don't get sick of him. The only way you're getting sick of him is because you haven't been pushing into him. The only way you're getting tired of him is because you stopped pushing into him. The only way you don't want him anymore is because you stopped a long time ago not wanting him. But when you start getting into that phase where you're hungry for him and you're continuously hungry, he will continue to stir up that hunger and passion for you and you will never get bored of him. And my second point, you will have a greater gratitude towards God for the mercy and love he has shown you. If you are truly born again, if you've been regenerated, you will have a greater gratitude towards God for the mercy and the love that he has shown you. Romans 8.1, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Okay, I did a little synonym, look, look to the side for, for condemnation to see what words I can get out of it. Ready? Condemnation. Other words are accusation, judgment, blame, my favorite one, damnation, doom, sentence, disapproval. So check this out. I'm going to change these words into that verse. If you've put your trust in Christ, if you've asked him to change your life, if you've committed yourself to him by water baptism, you are now not condemned by Christ because you belong to him. So check this out. So now there is no accusation for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no judgment for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no blame for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no damnation for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no doom for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no sentence for those who belong to Christ. Now there is no disapproval for those who belong to Christ. Can I get an amen for that? Like, think about that, guys. Think about that for a second. Like, your, your mindset needs to change. We get into patterns in our life, destructive patterns, where even if we're born again, we have that, that, that dumb mind that tricks us and makes us think, well, you know, God still judges me. You know, God didn't really forgive me fully. God hasn't really taken away this sentence. I'm still going to have to pay the price. No, you won't. God takes all of that. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's no accusation. It doesn't matter if the enemy is pointing fingers. Well, he's pointing fingers, that doesn't matter. Because when he points at me, all he sees is Christ. When he points at me, this is what Jesus does. He lifts up his hands. He shows the scars. He shows his rib. He shows his feet. I am now seen through the veil of Jesus Christ. There is no blame. There is no damnation. There is no disapproval. For those who are in Christ, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to try to do something to impress God for it. You are approved. You are accepted as you are when you accept Christ. What does this mean? If I'm a new creation in Christ, if I have indeed been, been regenerated, been born again, then, then God does not remember my sin. Amen? But check this out. Does God remember my sin? So now I've been born again. I put my trust in him. My, my life's been regenerated. Does God remember my sin? Hebrews 8, 12. I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. God doesn't look back and say, I can't believe you did that four years ago. Can't believe you bought that Varvatos jacket two years ago. I can't believe you used to do that thing with that guy. God doesn't come to condemn us. There's no accusation. There's no condemnation. God isn't going to remind you of the filth that you used to do. The only person that reminds you is yourself. The only person that reminds you is the evil one when you allow him to, to do that to your mindset. But check this out because there's another, in a sense, paradox because Matthew 12, 36 says this. It says, we must give an account on judgment day for every idle word we speak. So am I, am I, for, am I forgiven? Has God really forgotten everything that I've done or has he not? Well, I was listening to Pastor John Piper today, if you guys are familiar with him. He's, a, he's one of my favorite pastors that I listen to. And he said this, and it, it intrigued me. He said it's both. He said God forgets, but he also remembers. And this is what he means by it. He said God remembers and doesn't remember. That is, he calls to mind or he doesn't call to mind according to what is good for us and what is good for his glory. So in a sense, put it this way. 
God remembers our sin when we need to remember it. If Andrew Villian next week starts saying, dude, I, I, look at me, look what I'm doing. Look where I've been. I'm doing this, God, it's not you. If I start to become prideful, if I start to become boastful, if I start to think it's something that I've done, Christ is like, hey, hold on a second. Do you remember where I pulled you from? It's not to condemn me. It's not to accuse me. It's, it's for his glory that I would be humbled. And I would say, God, thank you. Thank you for bringing me back from that place. Thank you for taking away that shame. Thank you. I used to have these thoughts, suicide thoughts. I used to do this. God, you saved me from that. It's not to bring condemnation to me. It's to remind me of his glory and goodness. It's not for him to be pointing fingers and saying, look how bad you've been. It's for him to say, look how good I've been to you. It humbles us. It brings us to gratitude. It reminds us of our new creation. It helps us to glorify him. Hmm. It helps us to glorify him. If he does not, if he does remind us, he forgets our sin. But if he does remind us, it's not to bring us shame. It's not to bring us accusation. It's not to bring us judgment or blame or doom or sentence, disapproval as we read from Romans 8.1. He allows us to remember these things for our own good. So that if I'm walking in holiness, if I've been rebirthed by the Holy Spirit and I begin to become prideful, if I begin to think highly of myself, if I begin to become lukewarm, if I begin to think I'm, I'm complacent, I'm not... I'm okay where I'm at. I don't need to grow. I, like, I've been saved. I'm good. I, I just show up to church and I'm fine. God lets me remember where I've been, not because he wants to point fingers, but because he wants to show how good he's been in my life. And guys, I'll tell you from personal experience, there's times in my life where I just fall down and I start crying just remembering how good God's been. And I, I pray that I would never get out, out of that season where I'm grateful for God's goodness in my life. For now, there's no condemnation for Andrew Villian. Now there's no accusation for Andrew Villian. Now there's no condemnation for Annabelle Drujora. Now there's no condemnation or judgment for Andrew Pope. Fill in, fill in the blank, fill in the word. But if you ever get to that place in your life where you feel like you're becoming complacent, if you feel like you're okay and lukewarm where you're at, I would challenge you. Say, God, help me remember my sin. Help me remember what you pulled me out from. Help me remember how good you were to me. And look, guys, God doesn't just say things to say them. He actually, he actually does what he says. He's not like us who say, hey, bro, we, we should get lunch sometime. How many times have you said that to someone with absolutely no intention of hanging out with that person ever? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't even want to get into it. You're like, yeah, man, totally. Delete his, you don't even have his number. You're like, yeah, I'll hate you up. It's not happening. But God doesn't say things just to say them. He actually does, and, and, and what he says, he means. So when he says that, hey, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. When he says that I've forgotten, I've forgotten. When he says that you've been cleansed, you've been cleansed. And a perfect example of someone who's grateful for God moving in their life, someone who's been drawn in awe to God's move of their life is King David. That's someone I always cling back to. I always run back to the Psalms because I just see how weak that guy was, man. He was, he, was, he was like no other. I don't see anyone else in the Bible that was as raw as David to cry out to the Lord and, and to put himself on the line to show how weak he was. But check this out. I'm going to read from Psalm 40. In Psalm 40, verse 11 through 13, it says this, Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles surround me. Too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs of my head, and I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. David is crying out to God for help. And look, in the, same, in the same psalm that he writes, he writes this. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. And I want to emphasize this. He brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock. So check this out. One second ago, David was crying, saying, God, please help me. 
Like my sins are so high, I can't even see anymore. I'm, I'm so low, I'm so jacked up right now, I don't know where I'm at. And then right after, he writes this. He says, I waited patiently for you, Lord, and you heard me. You heard my cry. You brought me out of my pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. David always comes back to giving God glory. David always comes back to acknowledging who saved him. And I went, I went on, a, on a trip to Matamoros, Mexico last year, I believe. And, um, man, it's not fun to get stuck in mud. Have you guys ever got stuck in mud with your car before? This is California. There's, like, no mud here. But we, we, were, we were in, like, the middle of a village. It was creepy, bro. Like, not creepy, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it was, there was one light bulb in the whole city where we were at. And it was just, like, a dirt road everywhere. We started driving out. It was pouring rain, and, like, a huge bus that we had got stuck in mud. And we had to get, like, this other truck to come out, pull it out. Like, seven, eight dudes are behind it pushing or shoveling. It was nuts. And I was thinking, all right, dude, we're going to, like, end up sleeping here and something's going to happen. And I started thinking about it as I was reading this psalm. It says, you, you brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. Other translation says, you, you pulled me out of the mud. And if, man, I wish I had a picture. I should have brought one up. But if you, if you see a car stuck in mud, you're like, dude, there's no, absolutely no hope for that guy. That guy's not going to get out. And I was Googling some pictures today, and, like, there's some dumb people in the world who get their trucks, like, stuck to the windows. Those guys aren't getting out for sure, all right? So I, I knew how it was, how sketchy it was, and how, like, I was like, God, we're not going to get out of this. Like, the bus is not going to move. There's no way. After about, like, 40 minutes of pulling and tugging, the thing came out. And I was just thinking about this today. I was like, God, you're so good. You're so good. How many times am I stuck in the mud in my own life? How many times am I stuck in my position in the mud and God pulls me out? How many times has he put my feet on a solid rock? Like, this is solid. I'm not sinking. Another translation says he pulled me out of the quicksand. Think about that. You guys ever seen those movies, someone's sinking, they're trying to grab a branch, it doesn't help, they die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Out of nowhere, some branch falls in, they grab it, it still doesn't work. <laughs> Leaves start falling. God actually pulled us out of that miry clay. So when we put our trust and our faith in him, when we've asked for that regeneration inside of us, when he's birthed us a new spirit through his Holy Spirit, he's taken us out of the miry clay and put our feet on a solid rock. God pulls us out of the mud every time. And that's the gospel, that Jesus Christ came down in human flesh. God himself, Colossians 1, um, verse 15, if I'm not mistaken, it says, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ came down as God. He took our sins upon himself and he died for us and resurrected so that we can have this life. Not so we can go through life questioning, not so we can go through life stuck in our minds. 1 Corinthians 2, chap uh, chapter 2, verse 16 says, we now have the mind of Jesus Christ. If I have the mind of Jesus Christ, I better start thinking like Jesus. I better start acting like Jesus. And when I get attacked, I better start quoting like Jesus. Three times he was tempted and three times Jesus responded, it is written. Know your Bible, youth. Know your Bible so that when the enemy comes to attack your mind, when he comes to speak lies over you, when he says you're not born again, when he says you are going to hell, when he says you are condemned, you quote the word. No, I'm not. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Right? 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21, it says, He became sin who knew no sin, that I might become the righteousness of God through Christ. Know your word. The enemy knows, your, knows his word too, but if you know it, it defends your mind. I just want to end with this quote, again, by Pastor John Piper. His punishment became our punishment. His resurrection became our resurrection. We are already sitting at the right hand of God, and we have passed from death into life, just like Nachi's talked about, from darkness into light. We have passed from death to life, and therefore, in that sense, we don't come into judgment. There is no condemnation. Nevertheless, clearly, we are going to come into a judgment according to our works. And what are we learning on Sundays about James? I can claim all I want that I know Christ. I can claim all I want that I'm walking with him, that I'm born again. But if my actions don't prove it, I'm a fool. If your actions don't prove it, you're a fool. You're lost. And this is the gospel of Christ, that I get to live out the gospel through my actions. I get to live out my regeneration, my rebirth, my, my born again spirit gets to live it out through my actions. 
through my generosity, through my kindness, through my love for others, through my accommodation to others. Philippians chapter 2, around 3 to 4, thinking of others is more important than myself, putting myself down, putting others first. These are the actions we get to show the world that we've been truly born again. God bless you guys. I hope this word spoke to you, and I'm just going to close out in prayer. So if you guys can stand up, um, I'm going to close out in prayer. So Father God, I just thank you. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that every person in this room has put their trust in you, has no condemnation, has no more judgment, is no longer defiled. They are now clean as a whistle, pulled from the mud, put on a rock, stamped by your blood, And I thank you, Father. I pray that every person in this room would be regenerated into a new creation. I pray, God, if they haven't put their trust in you, I pray that they would turn from their wicked ways, turn from the sin, and come to you. Your word says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins before you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, I pray that over this youth, that as we start 2020, we just come in this mindset that we are new creations, that we are regenerated, rebirthed by your spirit. And if we need to, God, let us, let us do just that. So I'm just asking you guys right now just to take a second. You don't have to pray out loud or anything. Just in your own heart, in your own mind, if you need to fix some stuff, fix it now. If, if you claim to walk with Christ and your way don't show that, if your lifestyle doesn't show that, if your words don't show that, if, if your actions don't show that, just pack that up with God right now. Be like, God, just touch me, change me. Give me a 180 degree turn. Help me be regenerated, rebirth me. Ask him to change that in you. So I just thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, God. Touch every heart, touch every soul, touch every mind. We bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name, all people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a good night.